All right, good morning. So this is Math uh, 0310, and this is our lecture for January 18th. I uh, want to remind everybody, those of you who are with me today live, and then those who are going to watch the recorded video later, uh, that I do have online office hours today from 11 to noon, and then again Sunday evening from 8.30 to 9.30 in the evening. I did assign practice problems uh, from Tuesday's lecture. Uh, Tuesday's lecture is really not material necessarily that we cover as part of the curriculum in Math 0310, but it is important, especially for Chapter 7, which we're starting in on. And so I really think it's important that you go through and do some practice on the stuff that we covered on Tuesday. So I finally sent uh, those problems out on Remind today. So if you have signed up for Remind and you got those, uh, I'll also try to post those in or on my Google site uh, where I put exam reviews. So mm -hmm. right now there's nothing in the exam reviews and I'll put something in there. I'll put those problems in there. And then Taylor just asked me about um, solutions to those and I will send the solutions to those problems out <clears throat> probably um, over the weekend and give you a little bit of time to work on them before I send out solutions and so I'll post the solutions on those over the weekend. I'll probably also send those out uh, uh, using Remind also. So I'll be looking for those solutions. <clears throat> Remember that anytime I, at, I assign homework, whether it's those practice problems or web assign or whatever, <clears throat> and I am going to be assigning textbook homework also uh, that's for practice, uh, that's fair game as far as asking uh, for help on that. So. <clears throat> You can either ask me uh, by showing up online uh, at, during my office hours. Uh, you can attend live lecture and ask me a question at the beginning or at the end of live lecture, because I'll, I'll certainly give you some time to do that. And then also, you can always email me a question, and I'll email you back a solution. Uh, usually, uh, almost always, almost always within uh, 24 hours, I'll send you back solutions if you email me as well. My first preference is that you show up for online office hours because that's what those online office hours are for and that gives you the opportunity to actually talk to me and I can talk to you and we can kind of make sure we work through a problem and that you don't have any questions about it. As far as WebAssign goes, your first WebAssign homework is due on January the 28th. Uh, there is a grace period on, on WebAssign it goes through, I believe you, it's either the 25th or the 26th. I don't remember for your class which day it is. But you've got to pay for an access code by the 25th or the 26th. So that still gives you about a week uh, to deal with that. And uh, But you can get started on the homework now, even if you haven't paid. Even if you're under the grace period, you can get started on the homework. And I do have some homework due on the 28th, and there will be some web assigned homework due periodically pretty much Every week or two, you'll have a couple of sections of web assigned homework due during the semester. So uh, I really want to emphasize here at the at the very bottom uh, this don't get him behind stuff because I don't typically extend due dates on web assigned homework unless something unless there's some extenuating circumstance or some technical issue or something like that, which I have been known to do. So. Um, so please uh, don't get behind at the beginning. I will drop uh, four of those, I think, at the end of the semester. So you do have a little bit of uh, safety net there when you miss a couple. But um, I, I did see last semester students getting behind frequently, and then they'd have a group of zeros, and it ended up mounting up during the semester. So it's something that you really got to watch for. Uh, and then today, finally, uh, we get started on what we're going to cover for the semester. So we're going to get started with um, factoring polynomials. We're going to talk about what factoring a polynomial actually means and um, talk about uh, GCF's greatest common factors, grouping, and trinomials. That's going to be our target for the day today. So Now, before I get started, does anybody have any questions that they want to ask uh, here at the beginning. Any, anything that you want to ask about?
And by the way, uh, uh, I would, I'll give you the same lecture that I would give a face-to-face -face class. And that is like, so for example, I just asked you guys a question and that was whether you had any questions, whether you had any questions or not. Uh, generally in my face-to-face -face class, I'll talk to my class a lot at the beginning of the semester about the fact that I do not ask rhetorical questions. So a rhetorical question is one where your, your uh, response is really not requested or really not uh, needed. Um, I don't ask rhetorical questions in class, so I, I want you legitimately to answer it. It would be much better just all the way around if, if, uh, if you answered questions. So if I ask you, are there any questions, and you don't have any, then I would rather you chime in and just say, no, you don't have any questions, or no, you're good, or whatever. Uh, that way I know you're still out there, you're still breathing, you're still alive, and you're still watching the video or the, uh, the lecture. And then also it just kind of helps me, uh, you know, keep up with where everybody is with the material. So once again, are, does anybody have any questions that they want to ask here at the beginning of lecture today? No, no questions. No questions. See, that, that just sounds so much better when people do that. Um, that just makes me feel a lot better. So, All right, and I even got a text or a chat message from Gianna that, that said that she had no questions. And by the way, a chat message, if you're in a position where you really can't talk out loud, which I understand some of you might be, that, absolutely okay. I have no problem with that. So, All right, then um, if you remember, then if we're good... Then uh, last time, if you remember, uh, we were concentrating on operations on polynomials. So last time, we talked about multiplying polynomials. That was where we finished the semester. So when you multiply two polynomials, you know, so like if I had uh, x squared minus 3 times uh, y plus 7, Right, typical multiplication problem where you had two binomials. You might use the FOIL method here. Right, and if you use the FOIL method, you'd get uh, the first, which would be x squared y, uh, and then the outside, which would be 7x squared plus 7x squared. Inside two would be minus 3y, and the last two would be minus 21. So what happened here? You you took two polynomials, you took two of them, multiplied them together, and you end up with one polynomial as an answer. And this is the polynomial you end up with as an answer right here. 7x squared minus 3, uh, x squared y plus 7x squared minus 3y minus 21. This is a multiplication problem. When you're starting with two polynomials, you multiply them together, right? And that's multiplication right there. Right, take two polynomials, multiply them together, you end up with one polynomial as an answer when you multiply them together. Well, factoring is kind of, in some ways, the reverse of that process. So factoring a polynomial means how do you take a polynomial that's a single polynomial like this and rewrite it as a multiplication problem? You know, and that's what we want to do. That's what we're exploring here. So when you start with one polynomial and you rewrite it as a multiplication problem, that's factoring a polynomial right there. Right? And so that's what, if I ask you, like, for example, on your first test, I would be, uh, that's not a, an, un, definitely not an unheard of question that I would ask on the first test, is tell me in your own words what does factoring a polynomial mean? And so factoring a polynomial means rewriting <clears throat> as a multiplication problem. Right, that's what we want to do. That's what we're talking about doing here. So we're re taking a polynomial and rewriting it as a multiplication problem. Now, um, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about complete factoring. So when we, when we talk about factoring a polynomial completely, this is what we're talking about. So for example, uh, if I gave you the number 21 
and I said, well, rewrite that as a multiplication problem. In other words, factor that number, right? Uh, when you factor it, you get uh, three times seven, right? No big deal. But if I ask you to factor 28, uh, and you write it as four times seven, which is fine, that is not completely factored because four factors again. And so when you completely factor it, you are writing it, continue to write it as, uh, as factors until you can't write any of those as factors again. In other words, all the factors are prime. And so this is called complete factoring right here, factoring completely. And that's what we're going to do with polynomials, just like with that number 28. What we're going to do is we're going to start with a polynomial and we're going to figure out different ways to rewrite it as a multiplication problem. Uh, and then uh, and then the factors that we get, we'll continue to see if we can write those as multiplication problems until uh, we can't do that anymore, until all the polynomials are prime. And in other words, none of them can be written as multiplication problems beyond that. All right, so that's what we're talking about doing. And uh, so there's lots of ways that, uh, lots of techniques for doing this. And so that's what we're going to explore going through this is uh, the different ways that you factor a polynomial. By the way, uh, just so you know, uh, one reason why we would talk about factoring a polynomial is that we are going to want to, um, so one reason to, to factor one reason we would like to be able to factor uh, a polynomial is that, like, for example, if we took a, an equation like this, and don't get too panicked about this. This is not something we're worried about right now, but we will be worried about it later. But if we wanted to graph this equation, y equals x squared um, minus 4x minus 21, uh, y, y equals x squared minus 4x minus 21. Well, that, that graph turns out to be a parabola, and um, you, when you graph a parabola, you would like to know where that graph crosses the x-axis. And it is hard to know where it crosses the x-axis the way this is written. Uh, it turns out that this particular polynomial could be factored, and some of you may know how to factor this already, and some of you may have, may have kind of forgotten how to do this, but if you factor it as x minus 7 uh, times x plus 3, it's a lot easier to see that this, much easier to see that this has x-intercepts at negative 3, 0, and at 7, 0, and that you've got this parabola you know, that's kind of doing something like this. Uh, and in order to be able to find the x-intercepts where that graph crosses the x-axis, you really need to be able to factor that polynomial, right? So uh, finding the x-intercepts on a graph like that is one place where we're going to talk about, um, where we're going to use factoring to help us, so finding x-intercepts. Okay, so that's one place in algebra where factoring is going to come to our rescue. All right, so uh, just kind of one little quick thing to look at there. All right, so um, factoring polynomials. This is what we're going to do. The, the first thing that you do, the always first, when you factor a polynomial, the first thing you always do is try to factor out a greatest common factor. Now, greatest common factor, the abbreviation is GCF. All right, and so we that's what we want to talk about first is taking out a greatest common factor. And this is so this is how this works out. Um, if you have a polynomial like this, if you have 10x squared plus 15x minus 30, let's say, a greatest common factor is simply a, a what the, the name suggests is a factor that is common to all of the terms in the polynomial. 
and then you can just use the distributive property to rewrite it. So for example, in this problem, five is a GCF, right? Five is a factor of each of these um, terms, right? We could write the first term as five times two X squared. And let me uh, put the five as a different color here. Um, right, the first term is five times two X squared. The second term is, uh, let's see, get the, is uh, five times three X. And then the last term is uh, five times six. Like this. Signs don't change anywhere in there. And so since there's a common factor of five in each one of those terms, we could use the distributive property and we can rewrite this as five times two X squared plus three X minus six, like that. And so what we've done is we have what we call factor out the five, right? This is what we've done is we fat, and that's this, that's the way we're gonna say it in words is factor out the five. And what have we done? We've rewritten the original polynomial as a multiplication problem, right? We started with one polynomial and we've now rewritten it as a multiplication problem. And all we did was simply take out a common factor of five, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward, simple. And this is always, always, always the first thing you do when you try to factor a polynomial. And that's frequently what gets a student into trouble is they forget to take out the GCF at the beginning and then they have problems later on in the problem. So, um, so that's something you always have to keep in mind is that, hey, if you're factoring a polynomial, look for a GCF before you do anything else. All right, next problem, we have 27x cubed. And please, by the way, as we go through this, if you have a question, those of you who are watching live, don't hesitate to stop me. I have no problem stopping as we go through this. All right, so um, the next problem, we have 27x cubed plus 18x squared minus 45x. All right, so uh, look at the coefficients first, the 27, the 18, and the 45. And there is a common factor between 27, 18, and 45, there is a number that divides into all three of those. What is it? For those of you who are listening live today, what is the greatest common factor between 27, 18, and 45? Nine. Good. All right, so you can take out a nine. And then, uh, then you've got X's, and are there X's? And you, know, you have two questions to answer here. Are there X's in every term? And the answer is yes. And then if there are X's in every term, then you always factor out the smallest power that you see. So the smallest power that you see is X to the first. And so that's a, in my GCF also is an X, just X to the first power. And that's my GCF. That means that there's a nine X in every one of these terms, right? And you know, technically I'm not, this is the last time I'm gonna write this step out by the way. So technically, what are you saying? That the first term is 9x times 3x squared. And the second term is 9x times 2x. And then the last term is 9x times 5, right? And so there's a 9x that's in every one of those terms. There's a 9x, there's a 9x, and there's a 9x. And it's the greatest common factor because it's the biggest number that you can do that with. So we take out that 9x, and then we're left with 3x squared plus 2x minus 5, right? And what have we done? We've rewritten the original polynomial as a multiplication problem. Now, what might be the case here is on some of these problems, uh, the polynomial we're left with might factor again. It might be, it might, uh, you might be able to rewrite it as a multiplication problem again. Now, we're not worried about that yet. All we're doing is concentrating on GCFs but don't think that this will be the end of the story when you take a GCF out. It's definitely possible, highly possible, in fact, that what you have left would factor again. So it's something that you've got to be uh, really be careful about. All right, uh, next problem. And again, don't forget to stop me if you have a question. So uh, next problem we have, uh, let's say, uh, negative 
24. This one will be, and as you see, we as we go through these, they're going to get more and more complex. And GCS, I'm assuming that you've seen GCS before, and that for the most part, you're feeling pretty comfortable with this. Uh, definitely going to assume that. Negative uh, 24, x cubed y to the fourth, plus, let's say we have uh, 48 x to the fifth, y cubed and uh, z and then minus 12 x squared y cubed all right so uh, the GCF let's talk about the GCF here first thing is if the if the first term is negative if the first term is negative, you always take out a negative GCF. So that first term is ne negative 24, so I'm going to factor out a negative. Always do that. Because you want what you have left at the end, you want the first term to be positive in what you have left. Okay, and then between 24, 48, and 12, what's the greatest common factor between 24, 48, and 12? Anybody? 12? Yep, 12, yep, that's right. And so we take out a negative 12. Next question, is there a x in every term? Yes. What's the smallest power on x that, that's up there? It's x squared. So that's what I take out. Uh, there, is there a y in every term? Yes. What's the smallest power on y that you see up there? Well, that's y to the third. Now, there is a z up there as well, but there's only a z in one term. There has to be a z in every term in order for you to be able to factor it out. And so the z is not part of the GCF. It's got to be in every term. That's why it's called the common factor. All right, so we're taking out a negative 12x squared y cubed. So when we do that, Uh, then we simply write down what we have left. And, you know, just simply look at it this way, that uh, in the first term you have a negative 24, you're dividing by negative 12. Negative 24 divided by negative 12 is 2. And then you had three x's, but you took two of the x's out. And so you have one x left. And you had four y's, and you took three of those out, so you have a y left. Right? That's just the way to think about each one of the terms. The next term, 48, take 48 divided by negative 12, you get negative 4. So notice when you take out a negative uh, GCF that all the terms are going to change sign. You In that middle term, you had 5x's, but we are taking out two of them. So we have 3x's left. Uh, we had uh, 3y's. We took out all 3y's, so there's no y left. No y's left in that middle term, but I do have a z. Since I didn't take any z's out, the z just comes down. And then the last term, now this is a very common mistake, believe it or not. <clears throat> the last term is negative 12x squared y cubed. And notice that's what we're taking out is a negative 12x squared y cubed. We're taking out all the factors in that last term. It is not the case, it is definitely not the case, that you just stop like that and, and close off the parentheses. Because I think the thinking is, well, I take, took out that term, so it's gone. But remember, um, you've got to be able to multiply this polynomial back out to get the original one, right? That's how you check a factoring problem is you just uh, do the multiplication and see if you end up with the original polynomial. And there's no way we would get that first or that last term there. And so this is wrong right here, right? What do you have to do? You have to, when you uh, take out the entire term, like I just did, the only way you can account for that is you have to put a plus one right there. Uh, and when you put a plus one, right now when I use the distributive property, now I would get that term back. So you have to really be uh, careful about that. Believe it or not, that's a relatively common mistake that I see students make. So you have to watch for that. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's go on to the next problem. Let's say I have uh, negative 15 uh, a to the fourth plus uh, 16 b squared 
minus 7c. All right, so now in this trinomial, well, the coefficients, the 15, the 16, and the 7, or negative 15, positive 16, and negative 7, there's nothing that divides into those um, outside of a 1 that's common. And then with the variables, there's no variable that's common to all the terms. So the only thing that's going on here is that the first term is negative. And so you'll look at this as that the GCF is negative 1. There's no other factor you can factor out there that you can take out. So uh, you just literally factor out a negative 1. And you can write it with a negative 1 out in front like this. That is certainly OK. Just remember that you're changing each of the signs when you do that. Or you can just put a negative sign uh, out there like this. Uh, the, either one of these would be acceptable. See, both are OK. Now, you do have to be careful with WebAssign when you enter an answer like that with WebAssign, sometimes WebAssign gets kind of funky, and it depends on who who wrote the original problem when they when they programmed it into WebAssign. And so sometimes it'll count that that one of those answers right, and sometimes it'll say it's not simplified. And so that's just something you have to be aware of, and know that maybe you might have to go in and change one of those um, change something like that when you enter an answer in WebAssign. I would never ever care which way you wrote that, uh, either one of those. Both of those would certainly be OK. All right. Next example. So this one's going to look a little bit different. Let's say we have 3a times x plus y minus 4b times x plus y. Now this looks really different than the ones we've been talking about. Uh, because of the way it's written, it's, it's got, actually got multiplication problems inside like that. Um, but we don't do anything different with this one than we've been doing with any of the other problems. Is there a GCF here? Is there a factor that's common in each of the terms? You know, so the terms are those two expressions right there. Those are the terms. And they do have a common factor. And the common factor is x plus y. Now, the, that common factor looks different than the common factors and the problems at the top of the screen there, but it, you don't do anything different here at all. And so what do I do? I take that common factor and I remove it. I, I bring that out as a GCF, as a common factor, just like I would in any of the other problems, and then I simply write down what's left. And, and I'm being consistent about the way I'm writing this out. If you think about it, on all the other problems, where was the GCF? Like, look at the problem at the very top here. This is the GCF right here, right? I always wrote the GCF first. That was the factor that was common to all the terms. <clears throat> and then what did I write afterwards? What I wrote afterwards were the leftovers, right? What's left? Uh, after you've taken out the GCF. Let's see, notice that's exactly what I'm doing here at the end, right? What's the GCF? What's the common factor? What factor is in both of the terms? It's the x plus y. So I write that down first. And then um, what do I do? I write down what's left right here. In each term, what's left when you remove the x plus y? In the first term, it's the 3a. And in the second term, it's the, four, the negative 4b. Right? And so that's what's left at the end. So I'm being very consistent about the way I write it. Um, so the x plus y will be written first because it's the GCF. Uh, and I'm always going to write the GCF down as the first factor in these kinds of problems. All right, so that looks OK. So the next example, all right, let's say I have um, 5x to the fifth times 2x minus 1 uh, plus let's say uh, 15x to the fourth times 2x minus 1. All right, so it, it might be helpful to underline the factors, or I'm sorry, the terms. These are the two terms, right? They're separated by a plus sign, so those are the two terms, and it's a multiplication problem in both cases. So then what's common between those two, um, and so what would the GCF be here? <clears throat> so don't do anything different. Look at the coefficients, the 5 and the 15. The, the common factor there is 5. 
and then x to the fifth and x to the fourth, the, uh, there's, there's an x in both terms. So I'm good there. I can take out an x, and I take out the smallest power of x, which is x to the fourth. And we got it. And then, and then it, there's also a 2x minus 1 that's common to both of those terms. So I'm taking out that entire expression, 5x to the fourth times 2x minus 1. All right, so I take out the 5x to the fourth times 2x minus 1. That's my GCF in this problem. So I'm going to, that's what I'm removing. This is the factor I'm pulling out of each of the terms. And then what am I going to do afterwards? I'm going to write down what's left in each term when I remove that GCF. So in the first term, I've taken out the 5, so it's gone. I had 5x's. I took out 4 of them, so I'm left with 1. And I had a 2x minus 1, but I've taken it out. So all I'm left with in that first term is an x. And then I put the plus sign. Right, and then I go to the second term. I had a 15. I took out a 5. So I have a 3 left. I had 4x's. I've taken them all out. I had a 2x minus 1. I've taken them all out. That's what's left right there. And so uh, these are my leftovers. This is what's left right here. Now, I know it looks a little bit different than the first problem we started with a couple of, you know, 20 minutes ago or something, but, but it's, we're doing the exact same thing. Uh, it's just that the factors look a little bit different. This is the only thing you've got to be careful about. All right. So uh, now, next problem. Uh, what we want to do, uh, by the way, I am going to be looking at some problems out of your textbook. Um, and remember, on the, the textbook, uh, when I refer to problems, and problem numbers and page numbers, I am uh, looking at the downloaded version of the textbook. You see, you've got uh, access to the textbook. First of all, remember, you can download it freely going to openstacks.org. And I've got the instructions on how to do that on my uh, Google site. So you can download the textbook freely. That's the one I want you to, to use when we're talking about homework. Um, you also have, home, you also have uh, access to the textbook through WebAssign. If you look on WebAssign when, you, when you're doing your homework, there'll be a, a button over to the left that says uh, online textbook or something like that. And when you click on that, you get the exact same textbook as the downloaded version, except for the fact that the homework assignments are not numbered and the pages aren't really numbered quite right either. Um, and so when I refer to page numbers and problem numbers, you have nothing to reference to when you're looking at the web assigned version of the textbook. Why they did it that way, I have absolutely no clue. Doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense to me, but um, I, they didn't ask me. So we're, please use the downloaded version. Uh, I, if I were you, I'd just download it to my desktop or whatever device you're using. Obviously with a phone, it, <clears throat> that might not be the most convenient thing to do. Um, but uh, I, would, I would download the book somewhere so that you have access to it and you can look it up. Uh, what I did actually is I actually did not um, print out the, the entire book. I did download the textbook to my computer and then what I did is I just printed out the exercise sets. So I went through each section and printed it. And so like right now, I've got the exercise sets sitting in front of me right here in a binder. And, uh, and that's what I'm using uh, as far as uh, referencing your homework and problem numbers and everything. So for example, right now I'm in section 7.1 of your textbook and I'm looking at page 801 and this is problem number 46. On that page. We're in the first section of chapter 7 and this is problem 46. And the polynomial looks like this. It's mn plus 4n plus 6m plus 24. <clears throat> All right, now um, we would look at that polynomial. We'd say, well, is there a common factor in that polynomial? And the, the answer to that is that there actually is not a common factor, right? There's no, no GCF here. There's nothing that's common to all four of those terms because there's M's only in two of the terms. There's an N in only two of the terms. And with the coefficients, well, the coefficient of the first term is a one. And so, you know, that's all you've got that's common is a one. So there's not really a GCF here. 
Now, even though there's not a GCF, sometimes there's a way around this that we can use when you have four terms. And when, when you have four terms like this, uh, this will frequently work, not always by the way, but it frequently will work and allow you to factor a polynomial. When you have four or more terms, the method that we would try to use is the grouping method. And so this is our next um, technique for factoring, is the grouping method. And when, does the, when do you think about using the grouping method? When you have four or more terms in the polynomial. All right, and so this is a way of sometimes forcing there to be a common factor. So what you do is you group the polynomial into two groups. And usually we try the first two terms and the last two terms. Now, you may, if you've talked about grouping before, you may have had somebody tell you, well, go ahead and put parentheses in there to separate the groups. The only problem with putting parentheses in there is you can really screw up the signs and get, get it all messed up as far as the signs go. So I never insert parentheses here. Uh, what I always do is I just underline the groups. So I underline the groups. And then I look for a common factor in just within each group. So in the first group, mn plus 4n, there's a common factor of n in those two terms. So there is a common factor there. And so when I, when I take that, m, that n rather out, I'm left with m plus 4. And then plus, and then in the second group, you do exactly the same thing. You take out a 6 there. There's a common factor of 6. And what happens? You're left with m plus 4. And so notice that there is now something that's common, and that's the m plus 4. Right. And when that happens, you have successfully started factoring this by grouping, right? So you're looking at this point, you're looking for a common factor, looking for a GCF. You need to have a factor in this step right here. You're looking for a factor that's exactly the same. So the M plus 4 is, is my GCF. And so I can factor that out, just like I was doing in the previous couple of problems. And then you write down what's left, and that's n plus 6, right? The m plus 4 is my GCF, and the n plus 6 is what is left, right? This is what's left. When you take out the GCF. All right, so this is, the, this is called the grouping method. Let me uh, highlight that. And the grouping method is used when you have four or more terms in the polynomial. All right, so when you see something that has four or more terms, think, it, will grouping work on this problem? Okay. All right, so um, next problem I want to look at. So we're still on the same page. This is page 801, and this is number prob problem number 48. So problem 48, we have this polynomial, pq minus 10p plus 8q minus 80, like that. All right, and so remember, don't forget, you look for a GCF before you do anything else. And there is no GCF, right? Don't forget that. Don't, don't think, hey, because there's four terms, I go right to grouping. It's absolutely not true. What you first do is look to see if there's a GCF before you do anything else. Always do that first. <clears throat> and once you've determined that there is no GCF, then you say, hey, there's four terms, try grouping. Right, so four terms, try grouping. So we underline the groups, boom and boom. And then we look for a common factor in each of those uh, groupings. So in the first group, what's the common factor in the first group? P. Okay, thank you, Taylor. Taylor, don't, don't mute yourself, Taylor. What do you have left when you take out the P? Q. 
two minus ten. Good. Okay, keep on going. Don't 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 leave me now. So what's the fit common factor in the next group? Eight. Good. You're doing great. And then what are you left with? Eighty divided by eight it is ten. Yeah, it is. It is ten. Yep, yep, yep. All right. So, uh, you, pardon. Yeah, yeah. I think you probably could have done that one in your head. So, uh, so do we? Okay. So Taylor, you're you're the one answering this. Are is there a common factor now? Yes, it's q minus ten. Good. Very good. So you take out the q minus ten. That's the common factor there. And very good. So you take out the Q minus 10 and you are left with P plus 8. And we've got the polynomial factor, right? So that's so the perfect. Very good. Uh, and so a very pretty straightforward uh, factoring problem there. All right. Uh, or pretty straightforward grouping problem. So this is page 801, problem number uh, 52, but it's going to be modified. In other words, I'm going to change the problem a little bit. Um, so on this problem, let's say I have um, 2x to the fourth plus 10x cubed minus 6x cubed minus uh, 30x squared. All right, so let me let me pick on somebody else. So uh, Raina, uh, are you are you with me, Raina? Yes. Okay, so Raina, is there a GCF on this one, first of all? Is there something that's common to all mm -hmm. of the terms? Uh, no. Well, uh, wait a minute now. Look at the, G look at the coefficients. Oh, oh, yeah. So look at the 2, the 10, the 6, and the 30. Is there a number that divides into 2, 10, 6, and 30? Two. Yeah, that's right. So there is a GCF here. And so like you said, there's a two that's common. And then notice, uh, Raina, that there is there an X in every term, Raina? Yes. And so that's right. So I can take out an X also. And remember, what's the rule is you, you always factor out the... I think you were about biggest to... One? Do, you just, do you factor out the biggest one or the smallest one? The smallest one? You always factor out the smallest one. That's right. Very good. So the smallest one in this one is 2x squared. So, or so x squared. So uh, there is a GCF here. And if you forget to take out the GCF, you're going to get yourself into trouble on this problem. So we take out the GCF before we do anything. Okay, so I'm going to take over from here. Very good, very good. So when you take out the 2x squared, you're left with x squared uh, plus 5x minus 3x, and then minus uh, 15, minus 15. All right, and I'm going to use brackets there. Uh, the only reason I'm using brackets is because I'm about to use parentheses, and so uh, this allows me to keep the grouping symbol straight. All right, so now I look at the groups. And so these are the groups right here. And so I continue, and now I use grouping, right? So the, the GCF is first, and now use grouping on what's left. And so the 2x squared, don't forget, don't play magician. That 2x squared has got to keep on uh, coming down. I see students play magician all the time and make it disappear, and it's gone. And then you don't have the right answer at the end because what you have left won't multiply to give the original polynomial. Right. So when you take out a common factor and you're factoring a polynomial, it's got to continue to be written down in each step after that. All right. So in the first group, the common factor there is an x, and you're left with x plus 5. And then the second group, don't uh, be careful. Remember what we talked about is if the first term of a polynomial is negative, you take out a negative. So the first term here is negative. So you take out a negative 3, and then that changes both signs. And I have an x plus 5 that's left. 
to really watch the signs there. I see sign mistakes with the grouping method all the time. And then is there a GCF on the inside there? Yeah, there's a GCF of x plus 5. And so I write down the 2x squared. Uh, I take out the x plus 5. And by the way, the brackets, I mean, you can continue to write them if you want. You're not going to need them here, but I'll show you. So you take out the x plus 5, and what are you left with? You're left with the x minus 3. And so you've got that polynomial inside the brackets filled out, or uh, factored, rather. Now, the, um, this is all multiplication, and so the brackets really aren't necessary anymore. And so you could have written it without brackets like this. Either one of these would have been acceptable. So either is OK. You actually see it written more the second way than the first way. But both of those would be just fine. OK, so a little bit more uh, complex of a uh, factoring problem, I'd say. All right, so uh, the next problem I want to look at, um, let's see. This is uh, actually a problem that, again, I'm going to kind of modify. This is number 57, but um, I'm going to kind of change things a little bit on it. So let's say we have x squared plus 5y plus xy plus 5x, like that. Now, is there, uh, so for, okay, so four terms, but the first thing we do is we check to see if there is a uh, GCF, and there's no GCF. Okay, so uh, there's nothing that's common to all four terms. The problem is here is if you underline the groups like it's written, notice that there's nothing common in the first two terms, right? And so, there's, so the only GCF there is a one, you have x squared plus 5y. And the second group, there is a common factor of x. Then you're left with y plus 5. Still no GCF. But there's nothing that's common. So, so is the answer that this original polynomial is uh, not factorable? Or is it, um, or what's going on here? And the answer is that you don't know this at, at yet, but you Sometimes you can rearrange so that it does factor by grouping. So just because the terms are written in a particular order, um, if you reorder it, sometimes you can factor by grouping. So sometimes changing the order allows uh, the use of grouping. All right, so let's take the original polynomial here, and let's say if I let's see if I can rearrange this so that it does uh, factor by grouping. So let's say, for example, I write the first term down, but those middle two terms, let's say I switch their order. So I put the x y first, and then the five y plus five x next, like that. Now let's see what happens when I look at the groups. Maybe this will work. So I took out the x, I take out the x right here, and I'm left with x plus y. And then in the next group, I take out a 5, and I'm left with y plus x. Now, don't get confused here. The x plus y and the, 5 plus, and the y plus x, remember, that's addition. Those are the same thing. It doesn't matter what order they're written in. So that is a common factor. And so we are able to factor this by grouping. And so I take out the x plus y. It doesn't matter which way you write it, but usually written x plus y. And then you're left with x plus 5. And so uh, that's something you have to be careful about. That sometimes changing the order will allow you to use grouping, even if you couldn't use grouping on the original problem like that. So, all right. So uh, what have we done so far? Uh, let's, let's, take, let's step back for a second. Um, what we've done so far with factoring is, um, this is where we've got, this is, no, we're not finished with the day yet, but, so with factoring, we have first said 
the first thing you do is you look for a GCF. Right, that's always the first thing you do. And now we know that if you have four or more terms, then try grouping. So, so that's kind of where we are at this point. So now what we're going to do is, well, if, if four or more terms you try grouping, then what we want to do, evidently the number of terms affects this, so we're going to look at what happens if you have three terms in a polynomial next, in other words, a trinomial. Right, and so we want to look at how to do this. And now and I'm going to go ahead and kind of outline how this is going to work for the rest of the, the time that we're going to talk about factoring. So with three terms with trinomials, what I do is I split these up into th actually three groups. And we're going to look at the first group today and, um, and then the other two groups next time. And what I do is I split these up into what I call easy trinomials. And easy trinomials are ones where the lead coefficient is equal to 1. If you start off with a 1, then, then uh, I, as the first coefficient on the trinomial, I'm going to say that that's in what we call an easy trinomial. And we're going to talk about those today. Uh, and then if the lead coefficient is not a 1, I, I usually just refer to those as not so easy trinomials. we're going to uh, kind of approach those a little bit differently. Those are a little bit more difficult. And so here the lead coefficient is not equal to 1. So the lead coefficient is a, a number other than 1. And then finally, we're going to look at what we call perfect square trinomials. Now perfect square trinomials are ones that where you have a trinomial, you know, I'll just say ax squared plus bx plus c is our trinomial, and that it factors as the square of a binomial. If, uh, and that binomial might be something plus something, or it might be something minus something squared. So a perfect square trinomial is something that factors as a perfect square. See, like, uh, for example, uh, when they're talking about perfect squares, you know, um, if you're factoring the, the number um, 15, let's say, well, 15 is 3 times 5. Well, what about 9? Well, 9 is a perfect square, because what can you do? You can write 9 as 3 squared. You can write it as a perfect square. Well, that's the same thing we're going to be doing with trinomials. We're going to try to identify trinomials that actually factor as a square, like that. All right, so this is where we're going to uh, kind of get into today is to talking about three terms. And then we're going to finish next Tuesday in lecture with factoring two uh, polynomials with two terms. And polynomials with two terms, actually there's three different ways they might factor depending on what they look like. If they are a perfect square minus a perfect square, then it's going to factor. And if it's a um, perfect cube minus a perfect cube, it's going to factor. And if it's a perfect cube plus a perfect cube, it's going to factor. If it's a perfect square plus a perfect square, it is prime. In other words, when I write prime down, it means it's not factorable. And so we're going to explore um, what, those, uh, what those patterns are. We're going to actually finish those. Right, so I'm going to put just boxes right here because this is something that we're not going to talk about today, but this is where we're going to finish. Is what are these patterns for these three uh, forms for a uh, binomial? And if it doesn't fit one of those three forms, then it's not going to be factorable if it's a binomial. Right, it's going to be prime, or if it's a square plus a square. All right, so what have we done so far? We have done. GCFs, we've looked at grouping, and so now we're about to talk about easy trinomials. And so that's what we'll get into today, and then we'll um, 
look at um, more complicated trinomials, perfect square trinomials, and binomials next Tuesday to finish out what we're doing with factoring. All right. So uh, easy trinomials, or easier trinomials, if you want to say it that way, possibly. This is section 7.2 in your textbook. Easier trinomials. All right, so I'm on page 814 of your book, and we're going to work through some examples here and talk about how to go about doing these. All right, so the uh, first problem I want to look at is number 68. And number 68 is m squared plus 7m plus 12. m squared plus 7m plus 12. So first of all, don't forget, look for a GCF. And there is no GCF here, right? So don't forget that. I'm going to continually remind you of that because I really want to get it through to you that you should always first look for a GCF before you do anything else. All right, so now it's not got, it doesn't have four terms, so it's not a grouping problem. It has three terms. So if it factors, what we know is just using the FOIL method is it would factor as two binomials because of the way it's written. And we do know some things about these binomials. We do know that the first terms of these binomials would have to be M's. Because that would be the only way you could get that m squared up there. And then uh, the last terms, now you don't know what these are immediately yet, but you do know that those two numbers must multiply to give 12. And so it's either got to be a 1 and a 12, or a 2 and a 6, or a 3 and a 4. And then another thing you know is because of the FOIL method, if you take these middle two terms, and these outer two terms, right? in other words, the inside and the outside, and you combine those, you should get 7m. Right? That, that's the kind of the target right there, 7m. So with those things all in mind, kind of keeping all those things together, that would lead you to the conclusion that it's got to be 3 and 4. Right? That's the only way you're going to get a 7 there. You put a plus 3 here <coughs> and a plus 4 here, and it gives you a 3m as your inside to and a 4m is the outside 2, and when you add those, you get the 7m. And so you've got the factorization, m plus 3 times m plus 4. And if you think about it in words, what were you really doing? You were really simply looking for, um, looking for two numbers that multiplied to give 12, but added to give 7, right? And that had to be 3 and 4. And so that, that question allowed you to answer um, or, or write down the factoring for this problem. All right, so uh, the next one I want to look at then. It's ne number 78. Number 78, you have m squared minus 13m plus 30. All right, once more, no GCF. All right, nothing common to all the terms. And it is an easy trinomial because the leading coefficient is a 1, right? There's a 1 sitting in front like that. And so because it's a, a, a 1 there, we're really back to just this question right here. We're looking for two numbers, a and b, that multiply to give 30. In other words, they have to be factors of 30. And the two numbers must add to give negative 13. So you're looking for two numbers that multiply to give positive 30, but add to give uh, negative 13. And if you're not sure you know, what they are when you, when you start off on a problem like this, then write down all the factors of 30 until you think you've hit the two that are going to help you with this problem. And what's going to happen here, we can use a 3 and a 10 to do this. What, what would the two numbers be? It would be negative 3 and negative 10, right? Negative 3 times negative 10 is positive 30, and negative 3 plus negative 10 is negative 13. And so this polynomial would factor as m minus 3 times m minus 10. And by the way, if you write m minus 10 
times m minus 3, that is absolutely okay. It does not matter what order uh, you write the, um, the factors in, right? So both are fine. It makes no difference whatsoever. Now notice that if you just change just a little bit about the polynomial, so m, let's say we have m squared minus 13m minus 30 in this problem, not plus 30, but minus 30, this actually factors differently. Just change one little piece of that trinomial and you get a different factorization. Because now we're looking for two numbers that multiply to give negative 30, but add to give negative 13. And those numbers would be negative 15 and positive 2, right? Negative 15 times positive 2 is negative 30, so that's good. And negative 15 plus 2 is negative 13. That's the middle term. So notice I just change one little sign, and I get a different factorization here completely. Uh, negative 15 and 2 are the numbers that work here, and so I have m minus 15 times m plus 2, like that. Don't forget, you can always step back and look at the, what you've written down as the factorization and multiply it out. Make sure you get the original polynomial back. Right? That's okay. Um, and certainly okay to check that. All right. Um, really, we're in a spot right now where just a couple of more problems and we're going to be, uh, be okay. Um, and we can finish. So number 92 is next. You have x squared minus 3x minus 9. x squared minus 3x minus 9. There's no GCF here. And so what are we doing? It's an easy trinomial because this is a 1 right here, right? Since it's a 1, it's an easy trinomial. And so what we're looking for are two numbers that multiply to give negative 9 but add to give negative 3. But wait a minute, the only two numbers that multiply to give negative 9 are just 1 and 9 and 3 and 3. There's no way we're going to get a 3 out of that. So this polynomial is not factorable. There's no factors that exist that do that. Right, that multiply to give negative 9 but add to give negative 3. So there's, this is not factorable. And when it's a polynomial is not factorable, what I want you to write is prime. Right, prime when you can't write it as a multiplication problem. Okay. All right, so, uh, and that's going to happen, you know, so you have to kind of watch for that kind of thing. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, the next problem I want to look at, let's look at um, number 106. Number 106, we have P squared minus 2PQ uh, minus 34, I'm sorry, 35Q squared. So now the variables look a little bit different in this trinomial. First of all, remember, no GCF. Don't let me forget that. Right? There's, there, there's not a P in every term. There's not a Q in every term. So there's no common factor. The leading term is a 1. And so um, this is an easy trinomial. The only difference here is because of the way the variables are written, you know there's a P in the first term of each term, uh, each binomial, and you know that there's got to be a Q in the second terms. Right? That way, these inside two give you a PQ, and these outside two give you a PQ, and then that will allow you to co collect those and get the middle term. All right, and so now we're looking for two numbers that multiply to give negative 35, but add to give negative 2. And the factors of 35 are 1 and 35 and 5 and 7. And so what are the two numbers that multiply to give negative 35 but add to give negative 2? Well, that would be negative 7 and 5. All right, negative 7 times 5 is negative 35, and negative 7 plus 5 is negative 2. And so those are the two numbers that we need. And again, remember, it doesn't matter what order you write this in. So this is P minus 7Q and then P uh, plus 5Q. Right, so the inside two would be negative 7PQ, and the outside two would be uh, 5PQ, like that. And that would give you the negative 2PQ that you need. All right, 
So um, hopefully that's good, and we're 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 uh, working through this okay. All right, the uh, the next problem I want to look at. Uh, let's look at um, this one. This is just an example here. So let's say we have uh, 3x cubed minus 42x squared um, minus 96x. So 3x cubed minus uh, 42x squared minus 96x. All right, now at first it, it certainly doesn't look like it's a... a, a um, a problem that has a, um, it doesn't look like it's an easy trinomial is what I was trying to say. Right? It doesn't look like it's an easy trinomial, but uh, and it's not like it's written, but there is a GCF. And the GCF in this case would be 3x. Uh, and so when you take out that 3x, right now notice you are left with x squared and then minus 14x, 42 divided by 3 is 14, and then minus 96 divided by 3 is 32. And notice you're left with an easy trinomial. All right, and so now you proceed on with what the way we've been doing um, with the last few problems. All right, you're looking for a numbers that multiply to give negative 32 but add to give negative 14 right two numbers that multiply to give negative 32 and the two numbers have to add to give negative 14 so you're thinking about the factors of 32 and there's really not that many of them and the two numbers that you should come up with here are 16 and 2 right in, in particular negative 16 and positive 2 Right, x minus 16 and x plus 2. Negative 16 times 2 is negative 32. But when you multiply the inside 2, you get negative 16x. And the outside 2, you get 2x. And those add to give you the negative 14x that you're looking for. And so you've got the factorization. Notice also that that GCF, when I take that GCF out, I've got to continue to write it down. So I had to write the 3x down here at the, at the, uh, in that last step. So... So be careful about that, definitely. All right, so uh, we are going to uh, stop at that point. We're, we're proceeding it through our, this factoring. So next time, we're going to look at harder trinomials and then look at binomials and kind of finish up what we're going to do with factoring. So now, um, remember that you have WebAssign homework. That's graded. So WebAssign homework is graded. It counts for a grade. Right, so this counts. And then I have, I'm going to give you textbook homework, and I will assign textbook homework every class meeting pretty much. And the way I'm going to look at this is that this is purely practice for you as far as, far as textbook homework goes. It is not graded. I'm not going to pick it up. It is fair game for you to ask about it in class uh, or during my online office hours or by email. And what I would strongly recommend is that you do at least some of it every class period. You can get some practice out of the textbook problems every class period. So practice uh, at least some of these each day. So after each class. And, uh, you know, let me, let me point out, you know, um, and I taught intermediate algebra online last semester, and I'm thinking of a particular student of mine in that class who was a good student, ended up making an A in that intermediate algebra class online, and that student is now taking me for college algebra online also this semester. And so they had their first lecture yesterday, and uh, I got an email, or, or um, she showed up actually for online office hours, like an hour and a half after the lecture, so within an hour and a half, and she had a question about something in WebAssign. So what she had done is she had went directly from lecture to working on the WebAssign homework immediately. That's why she was an A student, right? right? You need to keep up with the material, and you need to do it on a consistent basis. You don't have to be perfect, 
but you have to be consistent and put in a consistent effort. And so all of you are capable, but those of you who are listening to me right now live and those of you who are going to watch this recorded later, all of you are capable of doing well. You've got to be consistent about your effort from the very beginning. And working on some of this textbook homework is a, is a good way to get practice going into the exam. Okay, So uh, I'm not saying you have to do it all, but these would be problems that would be good practice problems on what we've done um, so far today in class. So this is section 7.1, page 801, uh, problems 19 through 57. And what I would say there is what you ought to be able to, what you ought to do is at least every other odd, uh, every other odd, and that would be okay. And that uh, that simply means 19, skip an odd, and go on to the next one, 23, skip an odd, 27, and so on. If you at least do those, that's, that's pretty good practice in section 7.1. And then section 7.2, this is page 814. And there I would like you to do problems, um, or look at problems from 63 through 127. And then again, every other odd there ought to be enough practice on that. And so if, you know, web assigned homework is your first priority, and then this practice is next after that. But the more of this you do, the, the stronger you're going to be going into uh, your first exam. All right, so if those of you who are with me live, anybody have any questions? No questions. All right, then you guys have a wonderful day. I, I enjoy the, uh, hopefully you have a good semester. Uh, enjoy the cold weather. Uh, so I guess it's going to be cold again today. It'll be warmer over the weekend. Uh, by the time we are all back on Tuesday of next week, it'll be in the 60s and 70s. So, so have a great day, uh, and I will be in touch. Uh, don't forget to talk. To, come by during office hours if you have any questions. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.